You're listening to the Scotiabank Market Points podcast. I'm your host, Greg White. Market Points is part of the Knowledge Capital series, a collection of audio, video, and written commentary from Scotiabank Global Banking and Markets leaders designed to provide you with timely insights and analysis. Retail has changed forever. Decades from now, we'll likely look back on 2020 and 2021 as pivotal years in the advancement of technology and the creation of new consumer habits that will carry on beyond retail reopenings. On this episode of Market Points, Patricia Baker, Director of Retail and Global Equity Research at Scotiabank, is back on the podcast to talk about the year that changed everything for retail. Hi, Patricia. Great to have you back on the podcast. It's my absolute pleasure to be chatting with you again, Greg. I can't believe it's been one year since you were last on the podcast, and the last 12 months have been... Well, incredibly impactful for the world, but in the retail sector specifically. And last year, at the beginning of that first wave, you were saying that pre-pandemic in 2019, we were coming out of uh, a record year for bankruptcies and closings. And because of the pandemic, you were expecting 2020 to be worse. Uh, and then, of course, we've seen this huge uptick in online shopping. So was 2020 worse? Unfortunately for many, Greg, it certainly did end up being uh, worse Retailers globally, and specifically Canada and the U.S. that we're talking about here, faced even tougher challenges in 2020 compared to 2019. Many of them, as you know, uh, were not permitted to open, which really uh, challenged their ability to operate. In 2019, we had 17 retail bankruptcies. Uh, There were well over 30 in 2020. Uh, So you can see there that the pace was much accelerated In the U.S. alone in 2020, there were 12,200 permanent store closures, which set a record for that statistic. And we're looking at the bankruptcies that we we saw in 2020. You know, they ranged all the way from Aldo here in Canada, Roots uh, USA Division, J. Crew, Brooks Brand, Muji, a Japanese accessory retailer, uh, shut down their North American operations in, through bankruptcy. We even saw the storied 60-year-old New York icon, Century 21, go into bankruptcy. Other names, Papyrus, Pier One, Guitar Center, Lord & Taylor. So, you know, quite a list uh, of, of bankruptcies. And then when it comes to the closures, we had significant closures from some well-known retailers like Gap. Starbucks even announced the closure of 200 stores in Canada. Reitman's, Pink Tartan, Victoria's Secret, uh, Links of London closed down their operations uh, in North America. And Lowe's uh, announced a spate of store closures in Canada. That is just a sampling of what we saw, just to give you a flavor of how widespread uh, those two trends were. Lots of big names on that on that list. Uh, how has online played into offsetting? I mean, we talked about that last year as well at the very beginning of the pandemic. Now, a full year later, um, everyone's talking about the strength of, of online retail. Has it been enough? It has been enough for some and for others it hasn't. But definitely we have seen, you know, that initial resurgence that we saw at the beginning of the pandemic when retailers were pivoting to offer online services or enhance the online services they already had, and also pushing out curbside pickup, so buy online, pick up uh, in store. Those trends tended to accelerate through the rest of uh, 2020, and we continue to see very strong online sales from the retailers uh, that are doing online correctly. And of course, as I mentioned previously about the fact that you had a lot of stores that were mandated closures, a lot more here in Canada than in in the U.S. So for for those companies who had their stores required to be closed, uh, the online has been a lifesaver for them and really has helped uh, 2020 turn out to be a better year than it was anticipated at the beginning of 2020. And we continue to see very solid online growth. But at the end of the day, it, you know, my, my view is that retail will be not simply an online model, that the bricks and mortar uh, will still remain very, very important. And that has shown up quite well where we have seen reopening and where we've seen reopening. Consumers are 
very interested in getting back into the stores. The online uh, continues, but the retailers, the, the consumer rather, really does turn into an omni-channel shopper uh, use, using bricks and mortar and online. Everyone's talking about the technological leap we've collectively taken uh, through the pandemic, and that seems to be a, a bright spot if there is one that has been highlighted specifically for companies that have pivoted quickly enough. Uh, what have you seen with respect to operational strength and new processes that have actually helped uh, retailers in this time? Yes, there are, no, there are a number of companies, despite the challenges, having to face those challenges, pushed a number of companies further along than they might have been, uh, you know, without the challenge uh, of the pandemic. And I think here in Canada, I would use Canadian Tire uh, as an example. They, they did a tremendous job with their pivot to online and their pivot to curbside pickup. So operationally, they are further ahead than they might have been. Uh, there are many similar examples like that. But I would I would use Canadian Tire as one that does stand out here in the Canadian context for sure. When you've been speaking to executives at uh, these retailers, have they said that these innovations are likely to stick around post pandemic, like curbside pickup? Absolutely. Uh, at the end of the day, what a retailer has to do is to provide the product that the consumer wants when they want it, and in the manner in which they choose to purchase the product. And once you've exposed the consumer to something like the convenience of curbside pickup, you cannot take that away from them. Uh, curbside pickup is here to stay. And curbside pickup offers solid convenience for the consumer, but in the context of an overall online delivery of product to consumers, curbside pickup serves as a nice offset to the home delivery because for the retailer, curbside pickup incurs lower expenses. What about the pure play brick and mortar retailers? I'm thinking of the larger ones, specifically ones that you cover. Um, I mean, during this time, not having an online e-commerce presence must have been, I mean, damaging to some degree, uh, but maybe not so much for, for others, for instance, perhaps... Dollarama. What what are your thoughts on on those retailers? Well, it's interesting that you bring up Dollarama, and I think the fact that Dollarama was considered to be a retailer that provided an essential service certainly helped the company through the challenges uh, of COVID. But you know, there were particular markets and periods of time where Dollarama was not able to sell the full entirety of its store. The products, the non-essential products were restricted. But Dollarama has an incredible, uh, robust model and does offer consumers a unique shopping experience that they are, they are particularly interested in uh, getting in the stores. Uh, and so you know, that's a model that we think can withstand the threat uh, of online. And I think I mentioned to you last year that one model that was bricks and mortar only, which is Primark, which is a discount apparel retailer based in the UK, but with an international business as well. And not having the ability to deliver an online offer to its uh, customers was certainly a major setback for the likes of, of Primark during the pandemic. So as you can see, it really depends what category you are in, how relevant you are to the consumer. And that was a clearly considered a lost opportunity for them in the context of the pandemic. The pandemic has raised awareness of, of ESG uh, across all sectors. Now, what about the retail sector specifically? What kind of ESG factors is the retail sector concerned most with? Yes, I think the retail sector uh, differs from some other uh, sectors with respect to w where the focus will be. There's a particular focus uh, on supply chain that you might not see elsewhere. So retailers are very, very concerned and focused on the sourcing of their goods. Are they sourcing them responsibly? In the case of retailers that sell apparel or sell the good, the kind of goods that you would see at a Canadian Tire or a Dollarama, there's an intense focus there on ensuring that the workers that are employed 
by their vendors in markets like China, Vietnam, uh, India, that the workers, Bangladesh, that the workers are treated well and fairly. Um, another aspect that applies to retailers that doesn't apply to other industries, and particularly here I'm talking about the supermarkets, is there's a very important focus on food waste. There is a, an, an incredible amount of food waste in most Western countries. And certainly all of the players in the Canadian marketplace are very focused on reducing that food waste and are making some pretty great strides there. Also, talking about apparel retailers, there's some interesting things going on with certain apparel retailers trying to reduce the amount of apparel products that go into landfill. I think there's a statistic that says most apparel products tend to be thrown away after only seven to 10 wears, which is, you know, if you look at that, that's certainly well before their their sell-by date. So you're seeing the development of new models where retailers are offering to take product back and resell it. There are retailers that are putting in place programs to repair product and to re- and to take product back, apparel product back, and recycle it. So you're, I think you're going to see enhanced focus on what we would call circular economies. And there's some very interesting stuff being done by IKEA in taking product back and recycling. Lululemon recently announced a new program that they are piloting uh, in in Texas and California, where they will take uh, product back. So these are specific things that are specific to retail and don't necessarily translate to other industries. Sounds like some innovative work happening in the space. What else are you excited about uh, in 2021 for retail? I guess, like anyone, I am excited about retail being able to open again. I'm excited about seeing when the retailers do reopen, what lessons they've learned from operating in this challenge environment do they take forward with them? I believe there'll be a number of retailers who learned how to make decisions more quickly, learned how to innovate, learned how to make better decisions. And I look forward to seeing those that carry that forward and what that will bring for them in not only in 2021, but well beyond 2021. That was Patricia Baker, Director of Retail and Global Equity Research at Scotiabank. You can now find Scotiabank's Market Points on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. Don't miss an episode. Subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. And we want to hear from you. Please rate and review the show. Your feedback helps us improve the content we create for you. You'll find more thought-leading content on our website, gbm.scotiabank.com and you can also follow us on Twitter at Scotiabank GBM as well as our LinkedIn showcase page under Scotiabank Global Banking and Markets. Please refer to our legal disclosures on our website. I'm Greg White. Thanks for listening.